Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us again in what has been a fairly regular conversation uh, with our uh, P3 group over here at Hush Blackwell. Uh, we've been in a position to go through a number of topics uh, that relate to uh, project delivery, project finance, uh, managing through the uh, economic uncertainty that uh, COVID has brought upon us. And uh, a lot of us are talking about the um, the the excited uh, aspects of getting out and, and uh, coming out of this moment and, and really able to realize that the project delivery and project demand in our industries uh, has uh, gone through high levels of stress and risk management, but has, has stayed fairly strong. And we're very excited about, uh, about the, the forward looking uh, 12, 18, 24 months for, for this industry. Um, part of that, it has got to do uh, just with the, uh, the um, way the moment has been. And then another part of it has just got to do with some understanding that as things go forward, there's a lot of uh, infrastructure investment and municipal um, driven projects as well. Um, but regardless of, of what um, uh, aspect of project delivery or this industry you're in, uh, you, you hopefully have benefited from a number of the discussions that, that we've had um, and in some regards, uh, we talk a little bit about this, uh, this focus is uh, risk management or risk allocation. Uh, and we'll have discussions about finance, the economy, um, procurement, uh, project type, demand. Uh, one of the discussions we don't talk about enough is uh, the very real uh, geotechnical project delivery risk, um, the dirt risk, right? And there's a reason for that. Uh, it, it tends to be one of the most significant uh, issues and uncertainties going into project delivery and, and going through that process. Uh, I certainly have, have seen large discussions uh, and, and large amounts of work uh, to navigate around that. Uh, but the reason I would say that it doesn't come up uh, so much is not only that it's, it's not necessarily the most visible thing, but uh, frankly, there's some very highly qualified uh, professionals uh, that spent a lot of time identifying it, evaluating it, managing it, and dealing with it. And that's, uh, that's the group we've got here today. Uh, so uh, sometimes we're talking about uh, issues that we're all involved in, and sometimes we're in a position uh, to get uh, exposed and aware of the good folks that we rely on to help us navigate the, the things we know a little bit, little less about, but, but know that they're even more important. And that, that's one of these topics for me, at least. Uh, so I want to welcome everyone today. Uh, I am uh, Charles Renner uh, with Hush Blackwell's Real Estate Development and Construction Group and lead our P3 practice group. Uh, and along with me today is my colleague, Mike Kelly. Uh, Mike, um, among other things, is someone we rely on uh, in the, um, I'll say litigation avoidance. That's what our project delivery approach is, but uh, very much an expert in, in this regard. And I'm, I'm very happy to be uh, working with Mike, have him on our team together and also with this discussion. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to just cover a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your audience console, there are multiple application icons for your use during the program today. Uh, so if you have any questions during the webcast, please submit them via the question box, and we'll try to answer all questions during the webcast today. But if a fuller answer is needed uh, or we run out of time, uh, we'll make sure that that's answered via email later. And we do certainly appreciate your, your questions. A PDF of the presentation is avail available in the resource folder. Uh, and this program has been approved for legal education hours. To report your hours, click on the CEU icon at the bottom of the screen and the certificate of attendance, including course number, uh, will be emailed to you tomorrow. Uh, toward the end of the program, please be sure to complete our short survey. We use your feedback to plan future programs that are applicable to your business needs. And we certainly do uh, look at those surveys, uh, try to improve upon and expand upon the topics that we cover. So please, please take a moment to do that as well. Um, so that, those are all the housekeeping items for today. So I'm very excited to be getting started with our program. Uh, happy to be talking about a very important aspect of project delivery uh, with a um, highly experienced, uh, broad perspective group. Uh, and I would like to uh, take a moment now to just turn it over to my colleague, Mike Kelly, uh, to introduce our speakers and begin with the program. Mike. Charles, thank you very much. And thank you to everybody who's taking the time to join us this morning. As, as Charles mentioned, my name is Mike Kelly and 
I'm a construction litigator here at, at Hush Blackwell. Uh, it's very much my pleasure to have three true experts uh, in the field uh, when it comes to mitigating risk in geotechnical engineering uh, and project delivery. Uh, we have here today uh, three speakers. First is Aaron Mann, the Principal and General Counsel of Risk Management for Terracon. Michael Owens, the Chief Geotechnical Engineer for Kiewit. And Bill Williams, the Director of Western Pipe Operations for Garney Construction. Uh, I'm excited to uh, have each of them give a brief presentation on, on the topic uh, and then uh, have a robust discussion. Uh, about this uh, important part of project delivery. And so first, I'd like to welcome uh, Aaron Mann from Terracon. Aaron's a principal of Terracon Consultants uh, and serves as their general counsel overseeing risk management and litigation. He regularly manages outside counsel acting on behalf of the company and works internally to troubleshoot project issues and avoid disputes before they escalate. He's been practicing law for two decades with a focus on business dispute resolution. And prior to joining Terracon in early 2016, was a partner here at Hush Blackwell. His practice focused on commercial and cross-border litigation. And during his time at Hush, Aaron was lucky enough to spend four years working in the firm's former office in London, England. Uh, Aaron began his career serving as a judicial clerk for the United States District Judge in Kansas City, Missouri. He earned his JD from Creighton University in 2001. Aaron, thank you very much for being with us here today. Thank you very much, Mike. I, I appreciate it. And thank you, um, thank you, Charles. And uh, thank you, Morgan, for doing all the hard work behind the scenes to, uh, to make this as, as uh, seamless as possible. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, to be here and to to share a few thoughts uh, on on what is to me a, a very important topic and actually to be able to do that uh, alongside two of Terracon's very good clients, both uh, both Kiwit and Garney. Um, and I saw the RSVP list as well, and I and I see there are a, a number of familiar names on there. So thank you all for uh, for for tuning in today. Um, you know, as, as Mike mentioned, uh, I am a lawyer, and 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 if you were you know listening at all, you would notice that uh, he did not say I'm an engineer, and I am not. Uh, I have to be very very clear about that. Um, I, I do not have the ability to design anything. Um, I, I barely have the ability to construct IKEA furniture, but um, I spend my days arguing about whether or not the engineer did a good job or whether or not something was constructed appropriately. So. You know, my job is uh, kind of the ultimate Monday morning quarterback, if you will. <clears throat> and and at, at Terracon, we do we do about eighty thousand projects a year. And uh, with geotechnical services making up about a third of, of of that work. And of those eighty thousand projects, I spend my time focused on probably a hundred of them. And uh, and so that means, and I and I tell people this quite often. 79,900 of those 80,000 projects went smoothly. They didn't need someone like me to, to get involved. And, and that's quite literally 99.9% .9 of the time. Uh, but I live in the world of the 0.1%. And, and, and so I see the things that, that can go wrong on construction projects. And, and to be clear, even within that 0.1%, you know, within those 100 projects, I'm not even necessarily saying someone did anything wrong, either design or construction. Um, really, more than anything, it just means that things didn't go 100% according to plan. And, and unfortunately, I think we will know that that can happen. And with construction being a litigious industry, if things don't go 100% according to plan, there is that risk that you're going to have an expensive dispute down the road. And, and I spend my time trying to avoid those disputes, uh, trying to, to work with our clients, work with our internal teams to, to try to work through the problems before they escalate to becoming full-fledged disputes. And, you know, geotech's an interesting uh, space to be in because it's not always readily apparent what you're getting from your geotech. And I, and I think that that ties into some of the disputes that I see. You know, most owners and, and developers, they know that they need a geotech report. Uh, they, you know, they, they know that that's one of the, the boxes they have to check, but it's not always clear why that is the case. And, and I think there is sometimes a misconception 
uh, that, that all geotech reports are, are equal. And, and I would say that's definitely not the case. I'm, I'm often reminded of a, of a quote from Benjamin Franklin, um, who said that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. The geotech's role is prevention. You know, at the, at the end of the day, you can have the, the most beautifully designed building that's incredibly well constructed uh, from the highest quality materials. But if you put it on sand or on mud or on expansive clays and, and you don't account for those things, None of that's going to matter. So again, the geotech's role is prevention, and and unfortunately, uh, it's sometimes hard to see the ROI on prevention. I think until it's too late. Uh, but I will say that some of our some of our best clients, some of our most sophisticated clients, they see the value of that prevention. They see the clear ROI uh, when it comes to geotechnical services, and and they are they they invest in our services and they make us a true partner in their project. And the reason they do that uh, is because they know that they're more likely to have a successful project with that continuing direct involvement from the geotech. And that there's less likely that there's gonna be a dispute about the project, at least when it comes to issues related to, to the geotech services. And so in terms of a, a couple of key points that I wanna make before we, before we get into this discussion, um, the, the, the first is, I think it's it's incredibly important that you invest in the relationship with your geotech. And I realize I'm pretty biased when it when it, when it comes to this, you know. And and uh, but I would say I'm viewing this from a risk management standpoint. I'm not a salesperson, but I the the, the problems that I see, the disputes that we have, many many times they result from someone who does not invest in that relationship, someone who does not keep their geotech involved throughout the the, the process. And, 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 and that's the second point I would make is, is keep your geotech involved. Continue to work with them, continue to solicit their input. Um, unfortunately, we, we see uh, far too often uh, a type of situation where we might issue a geotech report and a year later, the, 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 the project goes to construction and we're not directly involved anymore. We're not a part of the process. And somewhere along the line, over that course of the year, changes were made to the design. Some of our recommendations were not followed. And, and, and unfortunately, you know, perhaps a couple years later, maybe that building or that project starts to show some distress. Well, we get that first phone call when that happens. They come back to the geotech because you know, we're the first ones out there. And the, and, and the idea is if something's moving, it must be a geotech issue. And so we have those calls and we talk it through with the client. And, and essentially they say, why do you think this is happening? And we, you know, for the first time, have a chance to look at the plans and say, well, you didn't follow our recommendations here, here, and here. And they said, well, why didn't you tell us that? We said, well, you never asked. We weren't, we weren't part of the process at that point. You know, once you had your, your geotech report, you, you went off and you, you developed your project. And that's fine. That's your choice. You can do that. Uh, but you know, really, if, if we were there throughout and you asked us, hey, can you take a look at these final design plans? Can you, can you confirm for us that this took into account all of your recommendations? We can do that. Any geotech would be happy to do that. And again, that's that that's that ounce of of prevention. Because uh, I will tell you, once the building's constructed, once the project's constructed, that pound of cure is very, very, very expensive. Um, so invest in your geotech. Keep them involved throughout the process. And and along the same lines, I, I want to be clear about one other thing, which is materials testing, um, specifically compaction testing or construction observation services. That's not the same thing. That's not keeping your geotechnical engineer involved. That is a that is a, a different, uh, very very helpful service. But the technician who is who is on your job site is not out there to you know, take a holistic view of the project and and see if the final design and what's being constructed if that matches up with the the geotech report that may have been issued a year ago. Um, instead, their job is to essentially you know drive pins into the soil and use their new gauge and figure out. Has the contractor reached 95% compaction? And report back to the owner. That's that's their job. And so what what I'm talking about is not you know hiring on the same firm to do materials testing, which I still think you should do. Um, it's keeping the geotech truly involved as a member of the project team. And 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 again, all of this is is coming from the standpoint of um, I I think in my in my experience communication, true continuing communication 
is the kind of the, the antidote for many, many, many project disputes. You know, we see um, we see disputes that come from either you know, our, our recommendations were not followed, or um, there are times when there are discussions about okay, you've recommended this, but can I do this? You know, the, essentially the value engineering argument: can I do this instead and accept a little bit more risk? That's always an option, and and it's up to the geotech, I think, to have a very very frank conversation with the uh, the developer, or the owner, to say you can do these things, but here are here's the additional risk that you're taking on. You know, we made our recommendations for a reason. You can do something less than that if you're willing to tolerate. You know, perhaps more movement, something like that. So I think you know, in terms of the the recommendations that are made. Um, additionally, the, the you know, with with the the, the costs that are involved, um, that obviously drives a lot of some of the the, the friction between a developer and and the geotech, uh, because they're looking saying, okay, well, you said undercut four feet, can I do two? It's going to save me a whole bunch of money. And say, okay, yeah, I mean, again, you can do that if you're willing to have some cracks in your slab and perhaps some door stick and things like that. Things that, you know, quite, quite frankly, may happen if you don't uh, follow the full recommendation. All of those discussions, I think, are, are important and they, and they, but they need to be very, very upfront. And, um, and I think everyone needs to be you know, fully apprised of, of the risks that are involved. Um, so again, I, I think a lot of this comes down to communication, and it, it comes down to building a relationship with your with your geotech and, and having them as a partner in the project. I think if you do those things, then you're less likely to have some of these disputes. You're, you're less likely to have um, you know an argument about change conditions. You know, so if the if the the engineer says I want to do 50 borings across your site, so I have a really good understanding of of uh, the, the subsurface conditions and the client says, well, I have a budget for 10. Okay, we, you know, we can do that, but there are gonna be a whole lot of assumptions that are made about the subsurface condition because we only have 10 snapshots now instead of 50. If we have 50, you, know, you have more information. You might be able to make a better informed decision. You might be able to save money elsewhere. Uh, but again, it's this balance between you know, an ounce of prevention and a pound of cure. And, um, and before we, before we uh, before I, I pass this off to, to the next speaker, um, I just kind of want to leave this on a, on a personal note, which is to say, my, my plan is in the next couple of years, I, I want to build a, a house. Uh, once my kids are, are gone and they're not going to trash the place, I want to I build a, a house for myself. And I know that when that time comes, I'm going to invest uh, quite a bit of money on the geotechnical side and on my foundation, probably more so than any home builder would, you know, they would look and say that that's, that's ridiculous. That's overkill. Um, but I don't have, I don't have the stomach for, uh, for the, the, the movement that, that honestly is part of, um, is part of, of building on this dynamic surface that, that is the earth. And, and so I'm going to invest in that relationship and, and I'm, and I'm going to partner with my geotech to avoid some of those problems. So again, thank you for the opportunity to be here um, and I look forward to the discussion. Aaron, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate um, your insight there and your true ad advocacy for, for partnership. We really appreciate it and it's uh, well done. Uh, next, I'd like to welcome Michael Owens. He's the chief engineer uh, for geotechnical engineering at Kiwit. He has broad experience in the field and has been an engineer on record of projects in multiple sectors, transportation, power, energy, and industrial, over 35 years of engineering and construction experience. He's got extensive personal experience in geotechnical areas of soil stabilization, ground improvement, support of excavation, walls, ground support, and access for cranes and heavy machinery, shallow and deep foundations, slope stability, de dewatering, rock engineering and blasting, settlement of structures, math, mass earthwork, drilling methods, and sophisticated laboratory testing. Uh, as chief engineer, his primary responsibility in the Kiwin Engineering Group is to help manage geotechnical risk for active projects and pursuits in the United States and Canada. He gets involved in projects with the contract delivery methods of design build, EPC, owner design uh, bid build, construction manager at risk, 
and construction manager, general contractor. He also has supported forensic uh, evaluations of geotechnical failures and provided uh, claim support for differing site conditions. He is actively involved with the geotechnical staff in the assessment of skills, training, and development uh, of in-house capabilities. Prior to joining Kiewit, Michael spent 14 years as a geotechnical consultant and was the principal geotechnical engineer for an engineering firm of 550 employees. In the first 10 years of his career, Michael was an earthwork superintendent for a large scale irrigation uh, and drainage projects. He earned his bachelor's and master's in geotechnical engineering from the University of Missouri Rolla, now known as the Missouri University of Science and Technology. He's a registered professional engineer in 10 states, uh, and we're so pleased to have his expertise with us here today. Michael, thanks so much for being here. Hey, thank you, Mike. Uh, and uh, thank you, Aaron. A, a lot of the, the things I'm, I'm gonna say are gonna echo what uh, Aaron said. Um, you know, communication, it seems to be the root of uh, success and lack of communication can lead us down a, a pretty rocky road you know, and the the jobs that I've seen that have, have really gone well, the, the geotechnical engineer is an integral part of the team. They 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 don't write a report and just go away. Uh, they're they're part of the team. They're they're there for for to provide counsel, to provide guidance, uh, and you know, quite frankly, some of as, as working as a you know as a consultant for several years, I understand the the side of of the consultant. So, you know their 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 risk and reward uh, mechanisms that are, that are there may not be there, and then now having spent quite a few years uh, with a large contractor, you know I see the contractor side of it uh, as well. So it, it, I've, I've, I have been fortunate to get that perspective. Um, you know, and and uh, you know geotechnical engineers are always or very often they're the first ones out out of the gate you know you get a, a design build project that's a, a long linear project and the and the geotech is is trying their best to stay ahead of the head of the construction and the design that's coming behind them um, and uh, you know a key part of of, of the success of a geotechnical engineer uh, gets gets is get it really revolves around that uh, what I, what I said about uh, being part of the team and, and, and that you've, you've got an adequate scope, you've got, you've, you've got, uh, an adequate budget and, uh, you've, you've engaged, uh, you've engaged professionals that have local knowledge and expertise, uh, that can help you through, uh, you know, problems that, uh, you know, you may not know exist if you're working from, from far away. I mean, uh, you know, you, you go into certain uh, locations and, and the locals, they, they know, they know what, how to, how to build there. And they know, they know the ground conditions and, and the, the hazards that, that you're, you're, you're subject to running into. And so, so I think that's very important in, in engaging that local, that local knowledge and that local expertise. And then, you know, I'm going to circle back on, on just scope and budget and, and, uh, and, and schedule for the geotech uh you know oftentimes uh, you know i've seen a lot of geotech work that was uh, essentially bid out you know lowest uh, lowest price got the job i mean lowest price is not the least expensive in this business by by far you know you want you the, you want the expertise and they need to have the budget to do the the exploration and the laboratory testing and and other potential uh methods of perhaps geophysics or, or other things to uh, demonstration programs and things like that to really uh, get the best value for the owner and the, and the project team. And, and that can get cloudy sometimes and, and hard to get to that point if, you know, everything was driven strictly by I'm, I'm, I'm comparing one, one person's proposal to another and, and, and then selecting the lowest, the lowest cost option. And, and it, it's, it's, often going to come back and bite you in the end uh so i say that and and and, and because i've seen that i've seen that many times over uh where where things didn't go right because there just wasn't an adequate scope uh and then 
a lot of the problems I've seen are, are oftentimes uh, uh, they circle around uh, what didn't happen, uh, things that they were omissions, not necessarily errors. They, they, they were, there was work that didn't happen. And, and then when we got to construction, we realized there were problems and, and, and certain things were never addressed to begin with. So, so, you know, with all of that, you know, what can we do to, to, to uh, engage, you know, best practices and, and th- to, to kind of avoid, avoid these risks and avoid uh, these problems. Um, you know, we like, we like geotechnical baseline reports where, you know, the basis of the design has been defined. It, it can often be part of the escrow documents and, and you've got a baseline report uh, that uh, these are the conditions you can rely on. These are the conditions that, uh, that you can base your, your bid on. And, and that, that's, uh, that's, they're part of the contract documents and they, they define, uh, you know, what, uh, what could, or could not be a different site condition, uh, you know. Uh, so, so those geotechnical baseline reports, we're, we've seen them a long time in tunneling. We're seeing them more often now in in more uh, conventional projects of, of uh, transportation and and uh, and other sectors as well. Uh, one of the things that that I've uh, enjoyed doing and being involved in uh, are are projects that uh, have early contractor involvement. Where you know you come in uh, as as the contractor, you're setting with the owner, you're setting with the designer. We're talking about the design uh, and what the owner's uh, objectives are and, and and what their goals are, and and we start flushing out the uh, the risks and who owns those risks. You know who who uh, if if a certain risk is identified as a possibility. Uh, you, you know who owns that in advance and, and they can uh, budget accordingly and, and, and it's a managed risk at that point. And managed risks can, can actually be profitable if, if uh, everything goes, uh, goes as planned. And, and if, if not, you, you're, you have, you're prepared to, to solve the problem when they come up. I mean, that, that's a constructability. I've, I've, I've set them through, I've set through some long projects where, we went through that process. It took longer to get the uh, design completed, but you know, you you uh, you set with the owner, you set with the designer. The designer threw out a concept, and the construction team reviews it, gives the in, in, input on the constructability, and and then again, uh, what are the risks and who owns them? So, uh, I've. I think there are contract mechanisms that that are more risky than others. I think uh, uh, when you when you get into uh, really fast paced, schedule driven projects that uh, the design is going on while the con- while and, and the construction is right on the heels of the design. Uh, you know, sometimes those those projects can lead to to, to problems that that are unanticipated. You know. And again, that that geotech engineer is out there on the critical path, and and uh, everybody wants them to get their work done and get get out of the way. But if you know if if the work is not done uh, judiciously and and with with and get the detailed information, they can't always do their job. So uh, I've seen it, seen that, and um, but. Uh, you know, there, there's just a there's just a lot of a uh, lot of risk in in geotech. I mean, you go out, you do you do an exploration program, you you drill borings, you do CPT or geophysics, whatever. You cannot cover a hundred percent of or even a fraction of a percent of the of the area that you're that you're looking at. So, so it's inherently risky from from that perspective that uh, you don't have you don't always have total and complete. Uh, complete information but uh i i I really believe though that i'm going to re i'm going to reiterate with what and and with what aaron said and what i the communication and the and the ability to have the geotech as part of the team uh they're engaged they don't just write a report and go away uh if there's a problem there's there's active participation in solving that problem uh if there's changes they're they're aware and 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 they know the changes occurred. They 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 were not uh, uh, left in a vacuum, and then come out later and say, "Oh well, you didn't follow the the recommendations." But engagement, communication, 
uh, all of, all of that all of that that goes with being a a active and productive part of the team it's key key to the success of, of the work I mean it, 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 it always is and and you know I can, you can you can see the jobs that have gone well where that happens you see the jobs that are problematic and then you start drilling in and you go into the details and you you, you see where where a lot of things fell apart and so that that's that's really what I have and and uh, turn it back over to you Mike and thank you Michael, thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate your insights there, and um, I like hearing themes that uh, both you and Aaron are hitting on uh, regarding partnership communication and uh, communication early on in, in the project, um, an important note. So thank you very much, Michael. Uh, third on our panel today, we have Bill Williams uh, from Garney Construction. Uh, since 1990, Bill has worked in the municipal water industry, managing complicated projects that include open cut and board pipelines, CIPP lining, and pump stations throughout the western United States. He spent the first 20 years of his career building both large and small infrastructure projects along the Colorado Front Range before joining Garney in 2010. He was appointed Director of Western Pipe Operations in 2017. He was the operations manager for the largest P3 water project in United States history, the Vista Ridge Water Supply Project in San Antonio, Texas, which was completed in 2020. Bill, thank you so much for bringing your expertise to the table today, uh, and um, please take it away. Well, uh, first I wanna thank uh, you and, and uh, Charles for giving us the opportunity to talk today. Um, and I also want to apologize. I'm having some internet issues, so uh, apologize about not being on the camera. Um, and and to begin, I absolutely agree with Aaron and Michael, where developing a relationship with a long, uh, excuse me, a local um, geotechnical engineering firm and maintaining that relationship and engagement throughout the construction is is imperative. But um, what I what I'd like to to talk about this morning is avoiding disputes uh, from really two different perspectives, um, which Garney and I personally have experience with, and that's the equity position in a P3 or, or the developer position and then the contractor position. And uh, we believe uh, one of the, the keys to avoiding these types of geotechnical disputes, which uh, you know mostly is differing site conditions, is is at the very start of the project, and it's the contract setup and uh, really the division of work. So next slide, please. So from the, you know, from an equity position, we believe that the approach uh, on a P3 project uh, to delivering it, the, the best approach is really the design build delivery method. But there's really, in, in our view of it, some very important parts to make that successful in that, in that contractual relationship. And the first one is that it's a fixed contract amount. Um, early on in the development of the project, getting the design build contractor on board and developing a fixed contract amount. The second is using really standard standard industry specifications. You know, we understand that every project has its unique uh, characteristics that need to be addressed, but if you stay with the standard industry specifications, it can avoid a lot of problems. And then finally, it be performance based uh, rather than than product based. And I'll use an example um, to kind of define what I'm talking about. It's it's a water if it's a water delivery project, it would be based on delivering quantity quality of water to a specific location rather than saying it's going to include three pump stations and 48 inch pipe. And so what, what are really some of the benefits of the design build delivery method? It, it really shifts the risk to the design build contractor and uh, allows them the flexibility to determine what level of investigation is required in conjunction with the geotechnical engineer. And, um, you know, the design build 
uh, delivery method allows both the design and the construction to have input on that. Next slide, please. So what about from the design build contractor's perspective? Um, the design build contractor's perspective um, would be that we would have one lead design uh, team and that that design engineer would have the responsibility for the entire design um, along with uh, hiring uh, or using internal resources for specific scopes of work, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then having one lead contractor. Um, where we've seen this extremely successful is having a contractor-led team. Um, this allows the developer to have some additional protection with uh, payment performance bonds. And, and this arrangement really allows the design firm to directly, you know, hire all of its subconsultants, including the geotechnical engineer and the contractor to begin early discussions with any specialty subcontractors that it may that it may need to uh, perform work during the actual build. Um, and and kind of repeating myself, but the contractor can determine you know what level of investigation is needed to actually build the work in conjunction with the engineer who can determine what level of uh, geotechnical work needs to be completed. Um, and and specifically with the cons consultation of the geotechnical engineer. Um, next slide, please. So um, one of the things that we believe um, makes uh, the design-build uh, contractor team work well is that uh, the contractor and the designer early on uh, when the, the design is just getting started is to divide the divide the work into specific scopes of work. Um, and what, what this really allows is it allows uh, each of the firms, the design and the contractor, to create focused teams that can work together on those specific scopes of work. So what do I really mean? Like, like an example would be, I, I talked about a pipeline project earlier. The engineer could, if he, if he was doing it in-house, would, would design, would have his design specialist work um, work hand in hand with the contractors tunneling or subcontractors tunneling experts to determine the level of information that's required for both the build and the design. And, and what this really means is that it allows those subject matter experts to have input on what geotechnical information is is needed to both complete the the work and the, and the design. So, um, like my colleague said earlier, you know, the relationship is between all of those entities is extremely important and allows the team to work cohesively towards delivering the project to the client. So, kind of in summary, you know, uh, we believe uh, the best way to avoid these kinds of disputes is to get the team pulled in earlier by creating a design build uh, relationship and allowing those subject matter experts uh, to be engaged and, and work, um, work hand in hand with the design team early on. I'll turn it back to you, Mike. Excellent, thank you, Bill. Um, I, I appreciate the conversation about uh, that delivery method and again, it uh, hones to themes that both Aaron and Michael discussed, uh, specifically about being intentional uh, in the scope of work of your, your geotechnical team. Um, I, I'm excited now to uh, invite the entire group to answer a couple questions. And uh, I wanted to start uh, with what Aaron talked about, that world of the 0.1%. The you know, where do the problems uh, occur? Uh, obviously, they, they don't occur on, on every project, and, and thank God for that. Um, but what is the, uh, in your all's experience, uh, the most frequent causes of geotechnical disputes um, or some of those differing site conditions? So uh, I invite anybody um, to go ahead and, and start us off. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, 
really where we see disputes is that um, it's a different site conditions claim and it usually happens when when or during construction and really it's uh, from from our perspective that we didn't have the right information or enough information to uh, make good good decisions on how the work was going to be performed i.e methods and, and so forth so you know to to our earlier discussions obtaining the right information and continuing engagement is is really the key and using those subject matter experts to ensure that we're getting the right information yeah and i would i would agree with that um i think that a, a lot of times you know that is that that is the discussion is what was there enough information you know did we either you know was the right information provided was the right information requested did we have enough to um you know, to, to put together a full design for for this type of project and 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 that that is a that's the balance that always has to be struck i mean no no one is going to pay for a a, a geotechnical investigation where you over excavate the entire site and say here's exactly what we found you know it's it's so you so you have to you have to figure out what the balance is how many how many borings do you need you know what what is the what is the level of of cpt uh testing do you do you involve geophysics things like that um all all of those things are you know they're they're going to better position you for uh, for for designing and, and constructing that that project, but but it is a, it is a balance that has to be struck. Yeah, I would agree with uh, Bill and Aaron on that, and uh, I would I would say that you know having having the right information, enough information, and then and then the uh, the engineers and the contractor and the owner all understand have an understanding of what has to happen to build what you're out there to build and and oftentimes you know it, it, there was there could be lack of communication to, to really have a clear understanding of the means and methods and the schedule impacts and, and things that that the contractor's thinking about and and uh what they have to do and um and and it may be that wasn't all uh communicated uh, uh adequately I, I agree with all, all of that this is Charles. I've got a, a question in the context of a lot of the work that we get involved in, and, and maybe kind of each of you going going through the same order, Bill, and then Aaron and Michael. But do you um, does your approach on the uh, owner collaboration uh, or any other aspect does it change when your customer is a public entity versus uh, private development? I mean, are there certain are there certain issues or uh, concerns or uh, communication um, undertakings that you need to focus in on the on the front end when you've got um, you know th that public versus private uh, customer side? Bill, maybe you could you could start. You guys have got a lot of a lot of public customers to to think about. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know that it it changes with regards to the to the specific geotech and 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 developing what information you know whether it's private or public um aaron spoke to it earlier it, it's really about setting the budget correctly um because we you know on most projects that we are engaged with we we go through the geotechnical initial and and then all of a sudden there's something that shows up and and we need to go back so, um, you know, setting up a budget that allows us to make sure that we get all the information um, early on um, allows allows the project to get started on the right foot. Yeah, and I would I, I would agree with with Bill that I think the I think that the deliverables are are still the same, uh, but I think that. There, there are certain sensitivities to the fact that you, you know that your client in this case um, is dealing with the public. They are doing this for the public good. And I think that, that there are um, other considerations that have to come into that, that that you wouldn't necessarily have to deal with on, on uh, you know, private development. And so I think it's, it's a little bit more of the, the, the soft skills as opposed to the geotech skills that, um, they, that you need for, for that type of work for that type of client. 
Yeah, and I, I would add that uh, oftentimes working with private clients, uh, some of their their objectives, their objectives in the in game objectives are different. Uh, they're trying to get something online that's going to be profitable for them if they, you know, so maybe the schedule is more uh, intense sometimes and, and everything's revolving around getting this thing built so it can start uh, producing whatever it's going to produce. And then, and then uh, uh, can you bring innovations in that uh, uh, geotechnical, you know, di different geotechnical methods or, or innovations into the project that uh, maybe the private client would uh, would warm up to uh, because they see the advantage of schedule and 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 uh, maybe cost impacts. But a private, you know, a public entity would say, well, we you know we we don't want to take that risk. We they see they're they're a little more risk averse and they they may want want to take take that kind of a, a gamble. So I, I do see some of that difference too. Thanks, Michael. Um, you all mentioned in, in your um, in your conversations uh, different um, um, contractual um, specifications that can help really create that cooperate cooperation and that problem solving attitude um, that you all had recognized as as crucial to successful project delivery, uh, including the the work of the geotechnical engineer. Um, do and I guess I'll start with, with Aaron here. Is there any particular um, contractual piece that you find to be important that um, really resonates with that sense of cooperation and problem solving? Whether that be, uh, I think Michael mentioned the baseline report and the construction documents, or escrow, or as Bill described, this design build delivery method for for the contract. Aaron, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I do. Um, you know, we we try to be very, very flexible with regard to how we set up um, our contractual understanding with our clients, and 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 that's that's going to vary, uh, you know, depending on the the particular project, on the particular client. But but we we always approach it from the standpoint of how do we each uh, come to a clear understanding. Um, you know, I, I believe it was uh, Michael and Bill actually were both talking about, you know, making sure that you've got a clear scope of work. All those things I think are important just to truly to manage expectations. And, and, I, and I think that's something that, that, that follows through throughout the delivery of the services that you've got to, you, you have to manage your client's expectations. And, and so, you know, for us, we have, we have certain things that, um, you know, that, that we try to do to, to work and partner with our clients and whether that's, you know, an alternative fee arrangement, um, you know, using a lump sum price or not to exceed price, things like that. But then also having the ability to say, but if you need more than this, if you want more than our clear scope, here's how we'll handle it. Um, so again, they're, 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 that, that hopefully eliminates the misunderstandings or the miscommunications that may come down the road. So that way there's, there's always the ability to, to continue to stay involved and to continue to, to help solve their problems. So our, our contracts are always kind of geared towards that. How do we you know, how do we how do we make it very very clear what it is we're delivering, and how do we make it um, very easy for the client to then say, okay, well, if I need if I need more than this, how are we gonna how are we gonna handle that type of situation? Uh, but but again, for me, it's always it's always about about managing those expectations about the project and about the the, the relationship. M Michael, Bill, and any thoughts on key contract provisions? Um, well, I'll just add that I think if you can set up the contracts to create a collaborative environment where um, the entire project team can work together, there, there are a tremendous amount of contracts and delivery methods out there. But I think the key key to the success is a collaborative effort to where um, all of the entities are focused on the project and and making sure that the project is a complete success rather than um, divisions and um, a conservative approach to protecting um, whatever entity that it, that it is. 
Yeah, I would agree there. Um, you know, we see contract language that's, uh, uh, you know, pretty harsh uh, towards the contractor. There's there's no maybe no differing site conditions are, are allowed or or they all the risk is clearly being shed to one entity in the in the in the team of the team. Then that's really not fair, and it and and it's gonna it, it's you know oftentimes will lead to the problems. So I'd add that to what Bill Bill just said, gentlemen. Um, we're, and then this is kind of picking up off of a, a couple of questions we're we're getting, but uh, you know as much as uh, we all work through things on the front end, um, not, not everything goes exactly according to, to, to plan, and really at the end of the day. Uh, everybody here is focused on getting that project to completion for the customer. And so I, I was wondering if uh, any of you had an example or two on a project uh, where, um, you know, where not everything ended up being as smooth along the way, but, but approaches that were, that were engaged to, to cure those geotechnical issues and, and get to completion. Bill, you've been on both sides of this of this thing. Have you got anything <laughs> come to mind on, on your end? Yeah, I um, without getting into too many project specifics, um, you know, so somebody spoke to you earlier that you know you can't you can't over -X the entire job. So you you know there is some risk, and and we've had projects where we've encountered, um, say, groundwater where we we really didn't expect uh, to inf to inf to encounter that and, and lots of groundwater. And so the, the key kind of uh, talking about what I did earlier is having the relationship so that you can get the appropriate team members to all collaborate to figure out what the, the best solution is to move forward rather than initially um, positioning, if you will. Um, and so, you know, be, having the relationship established early on and being able to collaboratively work together for the best interest of the project, I think is, is key. Um, you know, in, in that example, um, where we had, where we had encountered some groundwater, we were able to get the, the design engineer, uh, the owner and the geotechnical firm, um, and a specialty dewatering contractor, um, you know, to visit the site, to investigate it and to quickly, you know, remediating and moving forward is, is always the best scenario. And so we were able to develop a, a dewatering plan um, and get get through the, uh, the permitting process very quickly and not impact the overall project. So that, that's really how I believe that you work through those unknowns in a efficient and uh, collaborative manner. Yeah, I would I would echo that. Um, we've had a, a, a more than a handful of projects I can think of, and, and you'll forgive me for not giving specific examples, but uh, more more than a handful of projects that we've worked on where where there has been some kind of midstream disagreement, and 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 based on you know as Bill was saying, based on those relationships, based on the fact that you know the the the, the team players we all work together, we all do a lot of work together. Um, you know, it started with the uh, couple of angry letters going back and forth, you know, as sometimes happens. But, but the fact of the matter is everybody quickly said, okay, look, you know, let's, let's, let's work the problem. Let's figure out a solution to the client's problem. Let's get the client where they need to be. And, and, and at the end of this, you know, then, then we can have a discussion about, you know, who needs to pay for, for what piece of this. And, and, and doing it that way, again, because we had those relationships, doing it that way, it saves everyone a tremendous amount of time and hassle, particularly the project owner, uh, but, but also the, you know, for, for us, for the contractor, uh, for the other designers that, that were involved. You know, no one is, is and, I, and I, I'm sorry to have to say this, Charles and Mike, but no one's running to, to hire outside lawyers. Uh, you know, we're, we're, trying, we're trying to solve the problem and, and to do it in an efficient way. And, and, and we've, we've had a lot of success in doing that. But again, if you don't have if you don't have that relationship um, with the other the other team participants, it, it some some people are not as um, as quick to to be able to say, okay, we can put this on hold for now. You know, we we can essentially keep keep running the tab, and then we can have that discussion at the end. 
but but we've been able to do that um, on on a number of different projects. And 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 again, I think it's the you know enough time passes, the the the, the wind sort of comes out of the sails, and 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 you have an opportunity to to really sit down and, and make a business decision, which is what it should always be, um, as opposed to to running off and and having a lawsuit about it. And I, I would, again, agree with what both Bill and Aaron said. Uh, if you can proactively attack uh, the problem and, and get all parties uh, engaged, uh, you can. You, if, if something comes up and stops the job and just then people, you know, as a person told me once, first they, they're sad when something happens. Then if, if things don't go right, they start to get mad. And then when they get mad, uh, that's when, uh, when things don't go so well. And, uh, and maybe the calls to the attorneys start to happen. But uh, I've seen a lot of jobs where, where proactive communication and proactive uh, uh, action, just action on solving the problem, get everything back on off of off stop where it's not stopped anymore and things are moving, people, uh, people get more relaxed. And, and often there's, uh, you know, you've been able to avoid uh, litigation or claims. And I, I think, um, you know, from our experience, uh, I mean, I, I think everything you guys are saying is, is the right answer, right? I mean, it, it's a, a culture of collaboration and teaming, uh, especially when you get into uh, large complex projects, uh, public ownership, uh, different financing um, issues, and a lot, of, um, a lot of unknowns that you're managing. Uh, at, you know, frankly, uh, it's one of the reasons why in a lot of the um, P3 sphere, uh, the teaming is a big best practice consideration. You know, have these folks uh, done this work uh, with this team before? Uh, have folks worked together? And, and as I look at uh, all three of you and the companies that you work with, um, just knowing that, that uh, transparent collaboration culture that you have, it, it, it makes for the right answer. And it's probably why... Uh, you can list a lot more successes uh, from start to finish, regardless of what bumps happen along the way. So I, um, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I think that's probably the most valuable insight we've, um, we, we've, we've got. So that's great. Uh, and I'm always surprised at how quick we burn through an hour uh, talking about any one of these aspects and um, am grateful for uh, not just uh, uh, Folks like my colleague Mike Kelly uh, had given us the assistance to kind of talk through issues as as we start to address them, but also for the just the amount of knowledge and expertise and resources that we have um, with with folks like yourself. So we're we're very appreciative of that. Uh, continue to be very appreciative of everyone joining us for these discussions. Uh, we've managed to uh, continue to go through the whole sphere of complex project delivery. Uh, both above and, and below the ground uh, and on the public and the private side. Uh, so we're grateful for that. And we want to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, I hope and expect that the information was helpful to you and your organization. Uh, as a reminder, uh, the program has been approved for law practice management legal education hours. And so if you'd like to report your hours, just click on that CEU icon that I mentioned at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'll get you a certificate of attendance, including course numbers, uh, emailed to you tomorrow. Uh, and once again, please take a moment uh, to complete that short survey. We, we very much appreciate your feedback, not just to the program today, but for uh, future uh, topics that we'd like to focus in on. And we're uh, grateful for the audience and our panelists. And um, Bill mentioned Morgan. We're, we're grateful for, for uh, Morgan helping making us look, look as organized as we, as we certainly are not, and you all are. So we appreciate it. Um, and with that, I hope everybody has a great rest of your day. And thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, everybody. Uh, we'll, we will see you later. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Thank you.